Well, good morning, Grace Church family and friends of Grace, wherever you are this morning. We're so glad that you're a part of our worship service today. In these first weeks of a, a new year, we've been looking back and we've been in a series called Good Lessons from a Bad Year. We're looking back at 2020 and we're identifying some of the things that we came away with, some of the lessons that turned out to be good lessons, although we know that very often the good lessons that we learn at the same time can be hard lessons. And in this series, we have looked at what we've learned about prayer. We've talked about what we've learned about our need for community. We've talked about what we've learned about our yearning for justice in this world. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what we have learned about home and what it means to be at home and also what it means for us to find our true home. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my pandemic story going back almost a year ago now. In the first week of March of 2020, the Wake Forest University Concert Choir had planned a choir tour around London, England. They would do several concerts in the London area. It would also involve a day at Cambridge. And months prior to that, in late 2019, Marnie and I had decided that we would go over to England. Our daughter is in the Wake Forest Choir. We made a plan to go over and we would uh, attend some of the concerts and just enjoy London, which is one of our favorite cities. So we went over on March 6th. And even on March 6th, the world was feeling very uneasy. But uh, in my mind, I figured that if the university had not canceled the choir tour, then it must be perfectly okay to go. So we went ahead with our trip. But all week long, every day of the week as we were over in England, every day on the news outlets over there on BBC, things seemed to get worse and worse. By Thursday of the week... The United States had canceled all incoming flights from Europe, excluding the UK. By the time we went to Heathrow Airport the next morning on Friday of the week, I just wanted to get home. I simply had this feeling like I just wanted to go home. We had had a great week. It had been good to see our daughter sing. We had enjoyed uh, being in London. But by the end of the week, I just wanted to get home. We were pretty lucky. Our flight got back. We landed at JFK. We got through customs really without any trouble at all. But about two days later, that weekend, everyone from Europe who was trying to get on a flight before these flights were prohibited tried to get back into the United States, and major airports all over the country looked like this. The image you see here is simply the picture of people who are trying to get home. In a very real sense, the entire story of the Bible is a story of a people who were trying to get home. God created a good world, and at the very beginning of the Bible's story, God gave us a good home to live in. But we decided that we really wanted to be the rulers of the house. And when we did that, we lost that good home. We found ourselves alienated from the home that God had intended for us to have. And ever since that moment... We have been trying to find our way back. We've been trying to make our way home. And the entire Bible is a story, not only of our desire to get home, but of God's desire to bring us back to our true home. Within that biblical story, there is one particular narrative that we find in the Hebrew Scriptures where God's people were literally and physically forced from the place where they live. And that is the biblical story of exile. At this time, there was a prophet in Jerusalem. His name was Jeremiah. He knew that 
people from Jerusalem had been exiled to Babylon, and he wrote to them a letter. And that letter today is going to be something that we give our attention to. In fact, if you've got a Bible near you at home, I always encourage you to get a Bible and get it open. We're also going to put the scripture text up uh, for you to read on the screen. But we're reading today from Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to begin at verse 1 and then jump down to verse 4. Remember, this is a letter. It is a written letter from the prophet Jeremiah to the exiles in Babylon. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now down at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Now this letter might make a little more sense to us if we have a little bit of background about what had happened. So bear with me for just a minute. I want to tell you a little bit of history behind this letter. And if we went back more than a hundred years before Jeremiah wrote this letter, the nation of Israel had already been defeated by the Assyrian Empire. That left the little nation of Judah as the nation of God's covenant people. Now the world power that had come uh, to dominate the world was the empire of Babylon. And they had advanced against Judah. They had actually laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, and that siege had been going on for years. The conditions inside the city had deteriorated. The people were surrounded by famine, by death, Everything about their life was a, an experience of deprivation and scarcity. Finally, the Babylonians advanced against the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the walls. The wonderful temple that Solomon had built was destroyed. And the people, especially the leaders in the culture, the politicians, the artists, the teachers, the scholars, they were all carried away into exile in Babylon. You can see on a map that where they went was nowhere near their home. They were carried far away. And as they were there, they experienced something that you and I have probably experienced in recent months. In that place, they simply wanted to get back to the life that they knew. In fact, there's a line from the Psalms, Psalm 
37, the very first line, it says this, and it gives expression to their yearning. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. In that place of exile, when we thought about our home, when we remembered home and when we remembered the life that we used to have, we sat down and we wept. In fact, Eugene Peterson defines exile like this in his book, Run with the Horses. He writes these words. The essential meaning of exile is that we are where we don't want to be. But this very strangeness can open up new reality to us. An accident, a tragedy, a disaster of any kind can force the realization that the world is not predictable. That reality is far more than our habitual perception of it. With the pain and in the midst of alienation, a sense of freedom can occur. Today I simply want to suggest to you that part of the good lesson that we learned from a bad year was about our sense of home. And I would say that what we have experienced in recent months has really been an experience of exile. It might not be the typical way that we define that word because interestingly, almost all of us have been to some degree stuck at at home. We've been stuck in our very own house. But we have been alienated from the life that we knew. We have looked around at a world that looked strange to us. We have experienced a way of life that is totally foreign to what we have known in our past. And now the phrase that we've all used and we keep using it and we keep wanting to get back is returning to normal. When things return to normal, but the truth is we have no idea what that normal will look like. And we may not even know when we've made it back there. Just as we desire to get back to normal, the exiles in Babylon wanted to return home. And interestingly, there were prophets among them who were encouraging them to just be patient. Just be patient because soon we will be able to go back. Just hang on because soon we'll be able to get back to Jerusalem. And that's really the heart of this letter that Jeremiah wrote. He writes to the exiles to tell them, Go ahead and make a life and live your life right where you are. Live your life where God has placed you today. Don't keep waiting on some imaginary day in your future when you can begin to live life again. Settle into your homes. Plant gardens. Raise your family. Go ahead and celebrate weddings. I know that during the pandemic era, many weddings have been postponed. Some have been canceled, perhaps indefinitely. In recent months, probably since December, I have done two weddings. And they were probably not the weddings that were originally planned and intended. But the prophet Jeremiah is saying, go ahead and live your life right where you are. We have learned something about being at home, about making a home. And as I think about Jeremiah's letter and as I just reflect on our experience in these recent months, I think there are three things that we've come away with about what we've learned, a good lesson from a bad year. First of all, we have really learned about our yearning for home. Something in us, when the world is, is upside down, when the world seems to be falling apart, there is something inside of us that instinctively yearns 
to get home. Probably one of the most, if not the most, significant national event for our country prior to the pandemic was the 9-11 attacks back in 2001. When that happened, my children were very young. They were in preschool in Raleigh, North Carolina. And on that day, as events were unfolding and as it kind of dawned on us what was happening, what everybody seemed to do was get home. I went to the preschool, sat in a carpool line to get the kids and take them home. I look back on that now, I don't know that there was any really rational reason to do that, but it was something in us we yearned for home. When the world is falling apart, we yearn for home because home for us is where we find stability and security and love. And all of us yearn for that. Something deep in us yearns for home. And we've learned that in recent months. Not only that, we have learned about the grace that home gives and also the grace that home demands. Yearning for home is one thing, but being at home can be something different. Being at home demands from us a lot of grace, and at the same time, it gives us a lot of grace. Many of you might have been very fortunate and blessed to have your family, in a way, forced back together with not much to do. To hang out, to watch movies, to take walks, to play board games. And you might look back on some of those days as a wonderful gift, a grace, a blessing in your life from being at home. And at the very same time, there are probably many of you, the same number of you, who found out that being at home can be challenging because home became the classroom for your children. Home became your office where you were trying to figure out a way to work every day. Home became sometimes a little too close for comfort to people that you probably weren't used to being around all day long. I know in my family, my two college kids came home, and I think it was especially difficult for my son. It was the spring semester of his senior year of college. And honestly... He did not want to be in our house. That was really not where he should have been. And I knew that. We had great moments together, but we had some moments that were pretty tough. It takes a lot of grace to be at home. It gives grace and it demands grace of us. Home is the primary place where we learn patience and forgiveness, where we practice extending love to other people. I hope your home is filled with blessing. Mental health experts noted that for many people who were forced to be at home, this was not good because their homes were already characterized by violence and abuse. And being forced to be at home was not good. We learned something of the grace that home gives, but we learned something too of the grace that being at home demands. Yearning for home is one thing. Being at home is another. But maybe finally... What I hope we also learned in the midst of this, and really what the scriptures invite us to learn, is where we should seek our true home. Home is not ultimately a street address. Home is not ultimately a house. We were made for a true home 
where we find our peace and our rest, where we find the security and stability and love that we yearn for, we find that in the God who created us and loves us. Being rightly connected, being in fellowship with God is our true home. The places here on this earth can never ultimately give us what we are really seeking in home. Family members cannot ultimately give you what all of us are ultimately seeking. Those things come from the God who loves us and has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus himself said that birds have nests and foxes have dens where they can sleep, but he said the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus didn't invest himself in just a particular home And yet, he was absolutely at home in the love of God and in knowing knowing and walking with and fulfilling what God was doing through him. And that's our true home. There is a house in Seattle, Washington. It was built a long time ago. It's in the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle. The house belonged to Edith Macefield. Now it's referred to as the Macefield House. You can see an image of it here from the 1940s. Over the years, the Ballard neighborhood in Seattle was developed. It was urbanized. And all around Edith Macefield's home, buildings were going up. New, tall buildings all around her were being developed. And over the years, developers approached her. They really wanted her home. And they wanted the the little piece of land where her house sat. And she absolutely refused to sell. She was determined that she would die in her house. This little house, over the years, developers eventually were offering her $1 million for that little home as they built up all around her. And today, the house is still there. It is stubbornly wedged in between tall buildings. But in Seattle, it has become a kind of shrine. It's simply referred to as the Macefield House. It is looked, it is looked upon as a symbol of permanence and stability and rootedness in a world where everything around it is changing. But that kind of sense of permanence, that sense of home, can really never be placed just in our house, wherever you are today. And and today, every one of you who are watching this, you are watching from home in some way. You may be with others, You may be by yourself. You could be in a house, an apartment. What we yearned for was really never meant to be found simply in a house. We were made for our true home, connected to, close to, and at peace with the God who created us. One of the best stories Jesus ever told was about a young man who left home. He'd had enough. He wanted to get his share of his father's wealth and he wanted to go live his own life. And so his father let him do that. He took what money was rightly his. He left home and he went to be the king of his own world. And things did not go well for him. After a period of time, he had squandered his resources. He was at the end of his rope, and he made a plan to go back home. 
But his plan involved working. His plan involved going back and really doing whatever he could do to earn his place in the house. To earn his place back home. But as he made his way there, and his father recognized him from a distance, his father ran to him and embraced him. It's a very significant moment in the story because in the Middle Eastern culture, men did not run. It was shameful. For a man to run, he had to pick up his robes and expose his legs. But this father runs toward his son. And rather than the son working his way back home, the father simply says, no. And brings him home. And friends, my prayer for you today is that even coming out of a bad year, especially in these first weeks of a new year, I'm praying that God would simply lead you to your true home. Some of you today, you may be very far from home. Oh, you're sitting right in your house, but you are far from home. And the God who loves you meets you today, and He wants to bring you back to your true home. The best lesson, really, that we could ever learn And the best place that we could ever be. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? God, we are so grateful that, first of all, you do provide for us places to live. We never want to take for granted that we might have a roof over our heads. That when the night comes, we have a place to sleep. That we are, many of us, most of us, we are warm, we are well fed. God, we thank you for our homes. We thank you for our houses, the places where you have allowed us to live. And yet, God, we know we can never truly find what we most deeply yearn for simply in a house. And so, God, we pray that you would bring us And help us to seek and find our true home. You promised that we would seek you and find you when we seek you with all of our heart. And God, today we do that. We pray that you would bring us to our true home. And that having found our true home, it would change everything in our house. And we pray that in the powerful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.